I'd like to um, to start by saying we were t we were talking earlier about uh, panels that uh, we've all been on in the past, and it's and it, uh, it was the common experience of the three gentlemen here that they uh, w might have said something in the frankness of talking with fellow writers uh, about something, and 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 found themselves quoted uh, in in a cool or some such uh, place. So if there are any bloggers or members of the working press here, I'd like to say that everything is off the record, OK? And with that, um, I'd like to uh, uh, toss out a question to to all of our guests. We, we have with the, uh, you know, to put this this series of uh, uh, evenings together, and uh, do we do we treat uh, action adventure and thriller separately, or do they really fall in the same category? And uh, we decided that uh, there was enough overlap that um, that we should treat them together. But I wondered what your thoughts are, and if you draw a distinction between the two, or uh, if you think it's it's a useful exercise to talk about them together. Um, well, I think it's useful. I don't think that, uh, I think when you talk about action in particular, or action adventure is traditionally one of the most difficult you know, when people talk about an action movie, one man's action movie is another man's, you know, uh, science fiction movie or another man's thriller or whatever. I mean, it's really a, a difficult genre to pin down. In fact, um, on Last Action Hero, which was my, that was the first script I ever wrote, um, uh, which I was feel comfortable talking about because I was fired immediately. Um, uh, one of the things we did was watch every action movie we could get our hands on, and we tried to really, uh, my writing partner at the time, we really tried to figure out, well, what does define an action movie? What's the difference between, you know, why is Die Hard an action movie and not a thriller? And, you know, what makes a thriller? Why is Fatal Attraction, you know, something that's clearly, nobody would call Fatal Attraction uh, an action movie, right? It's a thriller. Um, and we didn't come up with a good answer. Um, I, things blow up. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I actually, or car chase. Well, yeah. I also think that in th I feel like I've never written a thriller, so I feel like I'm a little bit of a fraud. But um, I think in thrillers like Fatal Attraction, the although Basic Instinct I guess would be a weird one and disprove the rule I'm about to state, the heroes tend to be normal people. And in action movies, the heroes tend to be extraordinary people. They tend to be cops or bank robbers or superheroes or. And I feel like I know there's plenty of exceptions. By to the rule. I mean, normal. It's a thriller. It's a thriller. It no, is a thriller. Actually, yeah, that is. Okay. That's a thriller, right? <laughs> but but I do have to say, we were talking outside, and the bulk of of what we've written technically should be could be classified as science fiction. Right. We're we're gonna maybe come we're back on the wrong panel. Weeks, yeah. yeah. We will not. <laughs> we don't belong. But you know, um, I actually I remember when we broke them down, we realized that. Um, you can usually classify movies by whether it's a individual who's threatened, a family unit that's threatened, a community that's threatened, or the whole world that's threatened. And like certain movies, you know, disaster movies are always a community or a whole world. Um, thrillers more often than not tend to be about either a family or a surrogate family under threat. But uh, you know, as a writer, I find it really important to try to figure out what genre I'm in. But for the sake of discussion, it almost doesn't matter what you call it because we kind of know what we're talking about. You know, we, no one can define an action movie, but Here's, you know it when is, you see it. Is Born Identity an action movie or a thriller? Because both things, a it's action got both. movie for me. But it's got thriller elements. No, too. it to absolutely does. I for, for me, it's animated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, a lot of people think that. Uh, do you. Uh, uh, do you approach this genre, uh, the 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 amorphous action thriller uh, uh, genre, diff differently uh, than you would another, like a drama? Uh, and and how, what what kind of difference I mean, there, of approach is there? If you're writing an action movie, um, let's say on assignment, there's then a certain expectation that. Things are going to blow up, but that 
you know, that big events are going to happen. So there's a, um, you know, I think Joel Silver used to maybe still call them whammy moments. He does. You know, yeah, just, every, every 10 minutes or mm -hmm. something's got to blow up or there has to be a car chase or something like that. And there's certainly, or set pieces, I guess they call them yeah. now. It's how many set pieces uh, does this film have? And I've certainly been in many meetings at studios and said, well, how many set pieces are we talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and what, what quantifies as a set piece and do we have a, enough big set pieces? And do you find uh, that that's somehow valid, that there does need to be a certain number of uh, uh, set pieces or action sequences in a uh, in this kind of film and they have to be spaced at appropriate intervals? Or is that a too narrow way of looking at it? I mean, I don't think so but there is a there certainly is a code that you have to use when you're talking to the studios and mm -hmm. you know certainly I mean I know what they're talking about but sometimes you'll say like well this you'll say this really is a set piece even though it's not but you tell them that it is and here's how and here's why and I, I think that they I, they tend to approach things more so from a formula standpoint mm -hmm. you know yeah. but often um, it's interesting because I find that quite often there, you know, the understanding of what constitutes an action sequence or what <laughs> constitutes a set piece, what they really mean to say is trailer moment. What yeah. they really mean to say is, uh. what are we going to put in the trailer that, you know, where's the moment where Angelina Jolie jumps on the train and leans backwards and goes through the station? and. It's interesting. I, I talked to, I met for the first time um, Zack Snyder last year, and I was talking to him about his films just because, particularly with um, uh, with 300, there's things that people consider to be an action sequence or a set piece, which is actually like a shot, really. It's just one really long slow motion shot. And he, you know, I hope I'm not uh, giving away a secret, but he said, you know, that's a big thing about the way he makes movies. He feels there's this very outdated idea of what the audience expects. But the truth is, there's almost no car chase or gunfight that you can throw at an audience that feels new to them anymore. So it's really about building to big moments. And uh, it's really more about having a certain pace to the movie and a certain rhythm. And I think if you look at someone like James Cameron, uh, and, and look at any of his movies, one of the things you'll note is that every single action sequence has these ramp ups, then a stop where like the action stops literally Edward Furlong, you know, uh, screeching to a stop on his moped and then turning slowly and in slow motion the thing comes over and then the action scene starts up again. Uh, I really feel like the good filmmakers, the really good filmmakers, are kind of more looking for a rhythm to the movie, and that's what people are trying to ask you to write when they say set pieces and everything else. But um, I know in the X-Men movies, for example, Brian Singer didn't, he would say, I, I, can't, I can't think about action set pieces. I, I don't understand it. I understand thrillers, but I don't really understand, you know, I, I remember arguing with him saying, let's put Wolverine on a motorcycle and have him do this, that, and the other, and it'll be trailer will be him flying through the air with his claws out, which, you know, is in the Wolverine trailer now, but, uh, and he, he just said, you know, I, I don't, I can't make a movie that way, so. In, interestingly enough, we, I mean, this is a TV example, but, <clears throat> and I'm not saying this as a negative, because I actually think it was, in in some ways forward thinking, but uh, I'm involved in this new TV show and, and recently one Wh of the What's it called? <laughs> <laughs> and Flash forward. No, I'm not. I'm, I was just using this as an example. No, I know. I'm helping you. And 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 uh, one of the executives higher up said, you know, we'd be interested as the scripts come in for the episodes if if you would highlight the the either the lines. Or you know the individual shots, moments that you think are on TV, you know, promotional worthy. And what's, what's interesting about that is that's the first time I I've been asked as the creator to pick the moments, which is cool. And and that's what they should do, right? And, right. So so because th what this guy was saying, and I think somewhat astutely, is he said that the promotional departments you know, as they're cutting these pieces together, might not necessarily, as they see the scripts, understand the significance of this moment as it comes mm -hmm. down the pike. So it's kind of cool moving forward. We're identifying each episode and saying these five or six things are the ones that we think are are kind of the standout moments. You should, you should build your campaign around these. Cool. 
Simon, you were trying to. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, personally, I don't really approach the genre consciously. Like, I don't know, I've never written a drama. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't, just when I sit down to write, for because I grew up loving action movies and those are the movies that I sort of dreamed about as a kid and dream about now, that's what I write. I, I would imagine that the approach to a drama is somewhat similar, which is you start with a character in a situation and you try to dramatize that situation and build the character's arc over the span of the movie and the articulation of different Thanks. Of, yeah, of different gear shifts over the span of the film is just a little different. In a drama, it's like somebody gets married or they fall in love or somebody dies or somebody gets cancer or there's different sort of plot points versus in action films, something explodes or they get chased or they get framed. But the actual, I think, architecture of character-driven stories, if you're writing a good action adventure movie or a good drama, is probably fundamentally pretty similar. I, I think that's totally true, and I think it it pops out at you in relief when you suddenly are writing a movie that doesn't have that architecture, which Simon and I were just talking about um, um, movies you know, that we've worked on or that are coming up. When you start to work on a movie like a disaster movie or something where the plot is happening on a macro level where you're constantly cutting around to different uh, parts of the story, you realize, oh, this isn't like a normal character-driven story. Die Hard, you know, I remember once having an argument early in my career about whether Die Hard deserves to be called a B-movie, and it's no more a B-movie than any other movie Hollywood makes these days. It's a movie about a guy who's got a problem with his wife and gets stuck in a bad situation in, you know, the Fox Tower. But, um, uh, and believe I, there's a lot of jokes I could make there uh, about Simon, but I won't, because um, he's been stuck there. Uh, no, I, I'm just saying that, that there is something when you start to get away from that kind of story, you suddenly realize, oh yeah, that's what I've been doing this whole time, is writing character-driven stories, and now I'm not. So this is the difference. There, there, I would say, what, say one other difference, significant difference primarily between something like drama or comedy and an action movie is that most of the time, necessarily because it involves, an action movie involves stunts and chases and things blowing up, they're going to be more expensive. Yeah. And so the more expensive <clears throat> your project is, to a certain extent, there's a presupposition that it, it's got to reach the, the widest audience possible in order to you know, reap the returns. So again, the presumption is it's got to appeal to the lowest common denominator. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but there is that, you know, there's more of a burden. If you're making a $10 million drama it, you know, it doesn't need to make back a hundred, two hundred million dollars to earn back its money. But I think that, like, look at Dark Knight. I'm sure you guys didn't approach that movie being like we have to appeal to the lowest common denominator. No, 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 not at all. But we got that's it, that the Dark Knight and even Batman Begins was a very specific kind of the stars aligned in the right way. I mean, with respect to to Batman, the earlier iteration, which was uh, Batman and Robin, they it, they'd sort of reached this sort of grossest excess. Mm -hmm. Of of just, I I, can't, I would say like making an action movie, you know, you know, try by paint by numbers, uh, and and there was this jury nullification with the franchise, and seriously, and and people hated it, and just it it did poorly, and in that case, the franchise was so damaged by what had come before that Warner Brothers. Knew, they knew they had to do something so dramatically different that they were, I think it was only because of that bizarre circumstance that we were able to come in and and to say, hey, let's do the opposite. Let's make a real movie. Right, but it still, it still totally satisfies uh, the needs of a giant budgeted action adventure movie. It, it does, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't approach it from we need a set piece. Right. That was right. purely what would Bruce Wayne do or not do. Right. And then on the second one, we just got a free pass because of the first one. Right. But I think that's true for Iron Man. I think to some extent it's true for Star Trek this summer. Um, you know, it's. It, I'm just saying the approach when you sit down to write. When we get notes, the notes are often what are the set pieces, what are the uh, trailer moments, and then you sort of jerry-rig or expand sequences around um, sort of a character shift or a moment or a scene maybe that wasn't as big. But I just think the approach when you sit down to write, uh, knowing your films and having worked with Zach, is starting from character, what would the character do? You no, know, there's no question in the best action films, I think you really care about the character. If you, if you don't, then 
you know, it's just cotton candy. Right. But I, I will, to be fair, and since you know me and we have written together, I definitely will come up with a set piece or a series of things that I think are going to be really cool and then try to figure out who should be in this movie. You know, I mean, uh, and, and that's something that's very... Particularly when, you know, I always love, like, the stuff you're told when you're in writing class, like, you know, when you're, particularly when you're in college or in high school, but all the things you're not supposed to do, and it's almost like a, you know, don't, you have to believe in your characters and do this, that, and the other. And I, for the most part, that's true. But there's plenty of times, I mean, on X-Men 2, I remember thinking, wouldn't it be cool if, like, someone shot some metal in a guy's butt and then Magneto had to pull it out through his butt? You know, and it literally, that's where it started. And then the character twist of what Mystique was doing, and even where it went in X-Men 3, all that came out of a cool idea that I thought would be cool to put in. And I'm just saying that... That, that doesn't mean, you know, look, if you don't come up with good characters, you're going to be screwed anyway. But for those of you who are aspiring writers, uh, I absolutely think sitting in your room and saying, God, you know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see a guy run up a wall and defy the laws of physics and flip over and shoot his gun and then jump off top of it. That's a valid place to start. <laughs> As is, uh, in some ways, it's a lot more valid than a lot of other approaches. D you better come up with some good characters. You better find a way to get into it. But uh, sometimes inspiration comes the opposite direction rather than through that. That's all, that's all I mean to say. Do you guys uh, uh, believe in the three-act structure and, and use that as a tool, or do you uh, have a sequence approach, or do you, do you just let it come more um, uh, in a different way? Well, I don't know. I went, to, I went to traditional film school and was taught by Sid Field. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly started off that way because that's, I think... A, especially when you're a beginning writer, having that kind of structure or formula to adhere to, to bump up against, I think, and it makes you a bit more rigorous, and I think it can be helpful, but I, I've been writing over 20 years, and I've certainly started to deviate from that, and we decided on Batman Begins early on that it was a 4X structure, and The Dark Knight was a 5X structure, mm -hmm. and we just said, who are we even kidding? You know, it's... These are, and that's how we beat out the story. Um, would they have worked better if there were three acts? I, I don't know. But I, I so I, I think that's it. That's a, an example of you can't um, be too dogmatic. But I, you know, it, it, there's a reason why the Eris, you know, there's a reason why the three act structure resonates with audiences because it's a it's a familiar rhythm. Mm-hmm. You can say Aristotelian. <laughs> I know. I started above. I was like, I was, I was going. These people Aristos understand. <laughs> it's not Comic Con. They know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was we're like, at the writers. Guild. I was like, yeah, they want to. Oh, all right. Yeah. You're right. I, I, I've said that before, and people are kind of like, huh? Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Jacques Lacan, if that's okay. It's a bit of a no. All right. Sorry. Wrong. And I'd like to talk about uh, the Andalusian dog. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was. I actually think that. Uh, first of all, I think when people talk about the three-act structure, quite often when they say three-act structure, they actually mean any act structure. They're not really, you know, when people talk about how a movie has to have three acts, and even when you read, like I've read some of these screenwriting books where they say it's got to have three acts, and then they just redefine Raiders of the Lost Ark so that right. instead of being six acts, they have mini act climaxes or something, and it's like, this is ridiculous, it's just semantic. I have a feeling that these guys agree with me because I know, but I've written, I've read many of their scripts, um, and I'm familiar with their work. I, I think we're all pretty strong believers that you need to have the architecture in place for a story. That there are absolutes in terms of if you don't have the architecture in place, particularly these big blockbuster movies will fall in on themselves. You can't. Yeah. When someone says to me, you know. And I, I've had this happen on big blockbuster movies. Where like, I don't, we don't need to do that traditional Western storytelling where character goes from here to there, and you're just like, your movie is not going to work. You, you can't do that. You can't make a movie like that. 
Unless you are a genius who has made 50 movies that have worked that way and you suddenly come up with a different way to tell it, it is, I think, exactly analogous to when you, you know, the thing you hear about Picasso, you know, didn't learn to paint by starting with Cubism, you know, he knew what he was doing. Uh, I think that people who say that, you know, story structure is, you know, it's ruining movies and, you know, Robert McKee destroys blah, 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 and Sid Field doesn't know what he's talking about. I think it's crazy. I mean, but that's what I'm saying. I think I think it's really important, especially when you're starting out. And I think if you start to get some work under your belt and and you sort of more innately understand storytelling, then it's fair game to deviate. Right. More. I think you it becomes more, and it becomes. I think it becomes intuitive as opposed to intentional. So you sit down and you just happen to think in act structure. Like the grammar of studios is the three act structure. Like they ask about where's the first act break, the second act break. I mean, action movies, at least in my experience. They want um, a big set piece at the end of the first act, a bigger set piece at the end of the second. There's, there, there is a very specific structural grammar to the way the studios imagine movies, partly because uh, studio executives, I think, think in math more than they think in literature and when they approach screenplays. And for me, I actually use structure to make the process of writing screenplays less scary. Not necessarily because mm -hmm. I think I would advocate this structure, but when I sit down to write a script, I actually break it down into eight, sequences that are like 12 to 15 minutes long and revolve around some event in the middle of that sequence. I'm not saying everyone or anyone needs to write that way. For me personally, it's a good habit and it just makes 120 pages less scary because I'm writing little blocks as opposed to on page five thinking I got 115 pages to go. And do you outline that way? Really do, rigorously. Do you outline? Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't sit down and just riff it on a blank piece of paper. I'd be paralyzed with fear. So I, I, I try to do everything possible so that by the time I'm actually writing in screenplay form, I've almost half written the script. Um, yeah. But again, that's just from my own neuroses, not necessarily because I think there's an Aristotelian principle at work. Um, it's just no, how but I, do I, it. I do think you... It's more Freudian, yeah, yes. that principle. <laughs> I mean, I, I absolutely outline. I, I usually have, if it's in the case of a feature, I would at least a 20-page outline, if not a 30, 35 page outline and, and you know, often, quite often, two thirds of the way through, I'll find myself somewhat deviating from the outline because the characters will take on a life of their own or you'll get another idea. But I, I think that, you know, when I, when I started out writing, I really resisted the outline and I understand why because the truth is the outline process is the most painful process because that's where you're actually figuring out how to get from A to B to C. Yeah. That's where you actually have to do the hard work. It's really easy to write a first act you know, without an outline because it's all set up and there's no consequences. You don't have to pay off. You don't have to say who this person is going to turn out to be or you can just put all your really cool scenes in one act. And, and, and everybody, and I, I fight the same urge you want to resist doing the outline just because it's so damn painful. Uh, but if you if you if you start a script without an outline, usually what happens is about forty pages, fifty pages in, you kind of just spin out and get nowhere. Yeah. Uh, what do you feel you need to accomplish in the first fifteen or twenty pages of a script? Uh, you know, the, I I think those kind of general rules are the things that. I mean, having planted my foot down as a strict structuralist, uh, I don't follow any rule like that. And, and for example, when people say there needs to be a, a, a big set piece at the end of Act One, my response is, actually, maybe we shouldn't do a big set piece at the end of Act One because that's what everyone's used to. A set, in other words, I think you've got to separate what are the rules that are inherent to storytelling? Like what, you know, what things do you have to do? Your character has to change because if he doesn't, something will feel wrong when the audience is watching it. Does your character have to jump through some plate glass at page 30? Absolutely not. Does your first act climax have to happen at page 32 or whatever, you know, thing people cling to? Definitely not. Those are the parts of the rules you can break. But you better have a first act climax, and you better have a set piece, and you better have those other uh, elements. And I, I remember, um, I, you know, I've gotten into this argument a lot of times with studio executives, uh, where I feel like, and my wife's a studio executive, I, you know, I, I, and I love her, and uh, I think there's some great studio executives, very smart. I, people should, who are studio executives, should spend more time trying to understand story structure and trying to understand what makes a movie work 
and less time trying to do the marketing department's job, which, by the way, is more important than our job in a lot of ways. I, I mean, it really is, and God bless them. And, and usually they have a better sense of what's good in the movie than I do, but I feel like that's where you get all confused, where suddenly people are telling you, well, there's a rule that you gotta have in the first 20 pages, I need to know what my character's uh, goal is. In fact, I had this said to me the other day. And I said, well, like, what is it in Star Wars? And they said, his uh, goal is to become a Jedi. And I was like, no, what do you mean to become a Jedi? That's not his goal. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and the, the problem is, that's just a semantic debate about what the movie needs. Does Luke need to need something? Yes. Does it need to happen on page 15? No. And well, often you can have, you can tell a story, and I'm struggling to come up with an example, but I'm sure the audience can come up with many where the character needs something, but it's not till the end of the movie that the character figures out what the character needs. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. character often starts out wanting something, but what he wants turns out to be entirely different from what that character comes to realize that that. Yeah. They it's. Need. It's the irony of the whole, you know, you've heard people complain about proactive, you know, the, the, the big, somewhere in like 1992 or something, the word proactive entered our lexicon and became the most important word in the world. Um, it's interesting to me, I've noticed how on so many movies I've worked on, the note to make the character more active ends up in the exact opposite thing happening. Um, I, I don't want to pick on any specific movies. I, I, I think it's a big enough target to say that there's a lot of that in uh, the latest Indiana Jones movie, where ironically, the most active hero in the history of cinema is not actually, he's being tossed around like a pinball the whole time. And you start to realize that, uh, you know what, maybe this plot isn't an active hero plot. Maybe this is a plot about a guy being yanked around from this way to that way, and in fact, if he's too proactive, it's going to ruin the movie. You know, there, there's really well, or or unforgiven with where he's right, like not proactive till the very end. Exactly, or resisting the thing that he ends up becoming. I mean, that's the other. I find the most interesting characters are the ones that start by resisting the thing that they're going to come to embrace by the end of the movie. If there's sort of a we were talking about this at dinner, Zach, and if there's a very sort of articulated goal for the character in the first act of the movie, first of all, I know he's going to achieve it because I'm at a Hollywood movie. So like, uh, in a weird way, the suspense of the movie is gone. And it also isn't really the way that human beings operate. It's very rare that you think, oh, I want to grow in order to be a better husband. You just sort of, it happens because some trauma hits you or because something befalls you where you evolve because of it, not because you want to evolve. Right. That was, we were having a discussion, and this might be interesting to those of you who are, who are scribbling notes, which, by the way, I think is a really good sign. Um, <laughs> seriously, I, you know, my friends used to make fun of me. Wait, when a, I was sign, a sign that what we're saying is relevant or that Not they're, at all. they're being hope, studious? Can I just say, I hope you're doing what I do, which is I'm coming up with my own ideas based on what the person up there is saying. All I'm saying is I used to do that. My friends would mock me. They'd be like, what are you writing on? You're stupid. I, when's this, you know, reverse purple rose of Cairo? How's that going to be a movie? And, you know... Uh, um, no, I, I mean, I just think it's a good habit, honestly, is to take notes. But um, the thing I was going to say, what Simon and I were talking about before, um, what was the, <laughs> now I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> it, not the intention being, learning their intention over the span of the movie. Oh, right. Well, it was about a plot that's aspirational as opposed to, um, you know, not setting something up at the beginning where your character wants to get something if, in fact, the kind of plot you need is a disaster plot. Again, well, that doesn't work. You can't, you know, the ring in Lord of the Rings can't be a thing that everybody wants to get because the good guys hope to use it. It's got to be something bad that needs to be destroyed so that the disaster doesn't happen. If you change that, if you made it, what if they get the ring and it's all about, you know, look what we can do with the ring? Well, that's going to, your whole story is going to fall apart. So, and also, I would say by its nature, then most disaster movies are going to be reactive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a disaster's happened, we have to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, th uh, this is what I found from studying them. All disaster movies have a messianic protagonist. They all have a person who's walking around saying, the sky is falling, why doesn't anyone else see it? And, uh, you know, nobody ever listens to him. That was just, and I, the other thing I realized was that all big monster movies are also disaster movies. That basically a Godzilla movie has the exact same structure as you know, uh, Twister or any other disaster movie. Um, Twister is a really good example, by the way, of a 
it's really easy to see what's wrong with that movie. It's got the stakes of like a thriller or some sort of other kind of movie stuffed into a disaster movie. So like every time they try to tell you, oh, we got to beat Carrie Elwes to that twister, you're like, Huh? Well, no, what about the twister? I mean, forget yeah, about yeah. that guy. Yeah. What about the twister? But that's also a very strange, it, and the movie worked clearly, but it's a very strange movie because they're chasing the disaster the whole time as opposed to being chased by it until the very end. Right. Well, they're chasing the disaster, and at a certain point, you're just like, these guys are really stupid. Yeah. They yeah. keep, you know. <laughs> well, the tension doesn't work. I mean, I would argue Because you're like, well, duh, you're driving into the center of the storm, right, right. so. And they keep having to manufacture stakes for the movie to keep going, and that's what... That's when you know, when you get that feeling like, wh that's when you know there's something deeply wrong with the story structure. That is not about the filmmaker and the shot choices or the actor. That is story structure problem right there, to me at least. That you should write down. That guy. <laughs> uh, what's the role of comedy in this genre uh, or comic relief? Is it something you think about consciously as you approach movies of this kind? Hey, I'll speak on that for a sec because it's funny. I, I worked in a com a straight comedy for the first time, not as opposed to gay, but as opposed to not like an action comedy, um, for the first time last year. And it's a movie that's the sort of uh, like common, ver it's like, it's a movie with T Tina Fey and Steve Carell called Date Night, where they play a normal couple in the suburbs that goes out on a date night in New York City and like ends up in a murder mystery plot. And it's, a, they're sort of trapped in an action movie. And a lot of the comedy of the movie it, on that film is these ordinary people in this insane action context. And in my experience on an action movie, a lot of the comedy comes from the inverse, which is an action or superhero character in a mundane or ordinary environment like uh, Wolverine in a cat or in Mr. and Mrs. Smith's uh, assassins talking about the drapes. It's the sort of radical juxtaposition between the ordinary and the extraordinary. And in comedy, at least on this one experience, it's ordinary people in some insane world as opposed to insane people in our world. So, but the comedy in, in the X Men movies to me is, is at least in, in those films, is, is almost always these people have sparse. powers. Yeah, it's but, very but, sparse. but when, and, but when it comes, and sparser in Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's no, moments. Non-existent. Actually, yeah. I don't think it's non-existent. I actually think the Joker is a really funny character in in uh, in in Dark Knight, and that's part of the charm of the movie to me, is that like the moment where he puts the guy's pencil through the guy's head, is a shocking moment, but it's also laugh out loud funny. But that was definitely. I mean, those two movies, we did not sit down and say, we need some more jokes, you know? No. So yeah. we, didn't wor we did not worry about comedy with those two movies. Yeah. But, it, you, know, you know, there's comedy more so in the, in the Blade films, just speaking from personal experience. But I don't, I don't think that, that comedy is a necessary ingredient in, ac in action. I think it just depends on the sort of level of, 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 of peril, you know, or how naturalistic you're trying to play it's it. It's a tone. I mean, there's yeah. so many different it's the tones. tones. There's not a lot of comedy in the Bourne movies. Yeah. yeah. But there is in Die Hard, which right. you could almost say is, or like Lethal Weapon, or even Terminator 2, which is yeah, an interesting Yeah, Cameron's movie. got a good dark sense of... Uh, you know, I, I think comedy... I mean, I've written a lot of straight comedies, I realize. In fact, I, I came to... It's funny because I uh, sometimes in Hollywood you get defined by. Well, I'm sure everyone here has had this experience where you write one script and suddenly everyone says, "Oh, that's what he does." And I wrote a serial killer script when I was 25, and I remember people saying to me, "Have you ever written a comedy?" And I was like, "God, have you looked at any of my? That's all I write is comedies. I wrote this one dark script." But to me, whenever you get into a place where you are trying to be funny or trying to inject comedy, it's just deadly. Like, it's what, you know what, it's what killed Batman and Robin, for sure. Like, the horrible puns, everything else. I think you gotta, and the funny thing is, like, well, you guys are, we're all, uh, you know, I, don't, I won't comment myself, but these guys are pretty funny, and hopefully they'd say the same about me. We are not a dour group of guys. Uh, the truth is that most of the guys who write, you know, most of the guys who write comedy are. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's yeah. usually the inverse. I mean, right. most dour. The, the the funniest writers I know are usually the most miserable. Yeah. But yeah. I will tell you, speaking speaking to your trying to write, I've been in situations where, I mean, I've. I'm not generally known for comedy, but there there are occasionally comedic things in some of the things I do. But it's because the, you know, 
the opportunity presented itself, like Batman Begins, does it come in black, that kind of thing. But it wasn't like we were casting about for a joke. There have been times in my career where I've been writing something where, you know, either with myself or, you know, writing with a partner where we've, you know, funny joke here in parentheses, and then we never ended up coming with, up with anything funny because you can't come up with something funny that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's got to evolve from the situation. That's when they round table it and yes. you get that ADR. I, I, that's a, something that's such a mystery to me. You know, when you're in a movie and you hear the off-screen joke, it's like the, the cameras are pulling up in a way and you hear what is so clearly, like, Will Ferrell in an ADR session saying, you know, then I poop my pants. And it and I love Will Ferrell, by the way. I'm not I don't mean to pick on him, but I find I never laugh at those ADR jokes. I, I wonder why yeah, people keep doing it. No, but they come out those usually come out after the preview screening. But that's you've what I'm got, saying. You've gotten these you've gotten these cards that everyone fills out and they're like, We need to move the humor bar up by four percent. I remember one one time early on at, at Universal, an executive who's no longer even in the business gave me a note once and said, this script needs to be 23% funnier. <laughs> no, it was like, 23, not 27. And he was like, no, 23. Like he didn't even when given a chance to amend it, he didn't amend it. And he was right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, I think uh, uh, there's so much I could ask, but I want to give uh, time to ask uh, for the audience to ask questions. So, uh, how do we do this? We, you, we, you, we'd like you to uh, um, ask a, uh, you know, raise your hand and and then take a microphone before you start asking a question because we're taping this for <laughs> posterity, so we can charge the next group of people a lot of money. Uh, right. Excuse me. Right there. S somebody give that man a microphone. Oh, hey guys. So I was hey. uh, pitching a film recently, and I was comparing it. It's an action film, and I was comparing it to Gladiator, and I was saying that. Uh, they didn't do it right in Gladiator, that you have uh, this great story and then you have these huge fight scenes. And when you get to the fight scenes, the story stops. And then there's a fight scene and then the story starts again. And I was saying, in, in my version, I need to have the story developed during the action scene. And I thought that was a great idea and I went to start writing and I realized it's actually pretty hard. <laughs> and I'm wondering, uh, can you do that? Can you develop story during the, uh, the set piece? I mean. Yeah, it is hard, and the you know, we were just struggling with that um, on something we were writing the other day, which is, can we inject these dramatic moments into the middle of a chase? I mean, I mean, dramatic character moments in the middle of a chase, and by its very nature, it's hard. I don't think it's impossible. Um, I, uh, first of all, I think you're right. I think you're exactly right about Gladiator. Um, Gladiator's death wish set in Rome, and those gladiator scenes are not actually intrinsic to the to the story. Uh, I think if you watch a James Cameron movie, you will see an excellent example of the moment that Arnold Schwarzenegger first picks up the kid is during an action scene. The moment where you know you, I mean, I could go on and on. Aliens is filled with them too. He is a great example of every action scene. If you took those action scenes out, the movie wouldn't work. I mean, you'd be surprised. We've worked on, I mean, I remember on X-Men 3, we took an entire action set piece and moved it from uh, you know, the middle of the movie to the end of the movie. Um, although it, it did end up serving a story purpose. If you find that you can move things around that easily, then you're clearly not doing a good enough job. But yep. there are people who can do it. I think Cameron's the best, and there's probably some others. But the, you know, watch more, watch a lot of movies. You'll you'll see. I, I would also say when you're writing, or maybe after you write your draft, I don't know what whatever your process is. Pull out the action sequences. Look at them um, as separated from your from the rest of your script and look to see if the characters are evolving from sequence to sequence like are they becoming more brave are they becoming more powerful are they becoming less are they becoming more scared like it's you can actually track whether or not the characters are different in each sequence and if they're not different in every sequence, if, if Russell Crowe is just kicking different people's asses in every sequence, then you're probably not structuring 
the arcs of your characters properly and you're not using the action sequences to articulate that. They're just interruptions of character, like you say, instead of expressions of them. Like early on, one of the first people I got to work with who was going to direct Mr. Mr. Smith was John Woo. And if you look at his early movies, um, and Face Off, I think, uh, uh, the way he thinks about action sequences is like, I'm sure you've heard this, musical sequences in musicals, and it's a musical sequence isn't an interruption, it's just when almost the emotion of the character becomes so bombastic or so powerful that it has to sort of only express itself in song and dance, and for him that's what action sequences are. Um, and if you look at his early films, that, that that's true, the sequences are sort of an expression of where the character is emotionally. Um, and I just I, I just think looking at sequences as separate from the rest of the film and as tracking some sort of evolving arc is really important. Otherwise, you do end up with a movie where it's just a bunch of action and you better make the sequences really, really interesting visually or it's just all going to feel redundant. But the other thing I would say, just a thought, which is I think sometimes people have the assumption if I need to tell a story that it has to be through dialogue, mm -hmm. but it's a visual medium. So, you know, you can convey a lot um, on the turn of a prop or, you know, in the midst of an action piece, a photograph falls into someone's hand. I, I just remember that there was a film uh, before the, not that it was an action movie, but before The Devil Knows You're Dead, where the whole last act turns on just, you know, Albert Finney getting this business card at the pawn shop that, you know, has to do with the sun. And I just thought that was just so cool. It's just, I've, I've never seen so much effed up things happen as a result of an insert of just a single, you know, like he just realized, oh my God, my, s sorry to spoil it for you. <laughs> you know, my son was responsible for my wife, oh, you know, his, you I, know, his I, death. I was just gonna sorry, watch it. All right, all right. <laughs> no, but the point is, the point is, I think that's a, re that's not, that's not an example of story in action, but it's a really good example of, of just something visually just completely turning the whole movie on its head. And you can have those kinds of things happen in the middle of an action movie. You don't necessarily, or an action sequence have to stop for two pages of dialogue. Yeah. There may be a visual way to communicate what it is that you want to communicate. Um, I'll throw out another suggestion for a movie to watch. Um, uh, Last of the Mohicans, Michael Mann's Last of the Mohicans. Um, the action sequences in that movie, part of why they're so visceral is they're really well filmed, but it's also that really key story moments are happening in the sequence. Like you as an audience know who the different players are and what they're trying to get and what they're trying to accomplish. You know, Magua is trying to kill um, the Englishman's daughter and his wipe out his seed forever in every action scene. It's just that some of the action scenes he doesn't quite get to do it. So uh, that's another good one to watch for well integrated action into a script. Well, I, I would say Michael Mann in general is another of those sure. filmmakers that I think does that well. Oh, right, although Heat is a good example of hey, let's stop the movie and fire our machine guns yeah. for an exhilarating 10 minutes of machine gun fire. But it really is just, I mean, it's, uh, I'm just saying that you pick and choose, you know, some of his movies. It's actually, I think Collateral probably has some pretty good examples of that too. But not that you are totally right. I just mean, <laughs> that, but that is a good example of an action scene that's just there for action, right? Can I ask a question right here? Um, I had a question about character because I think a lot of times what's wrong with action films is that the character gets lost. I kind of felt that about another action film I just recently saw, but I won't say. But I'm disappointed. Did one of us write it? No. <laughs> Tell us then. It's what fine. Was it? it is fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Well, okay. I'll say that. I'll say like like T two because I mean T two. Yeah. Well, not T two. Transformers two. I'm just. I'm oh. oh. T F two. I can't say T2, never. That would be bad. <laughs> At any rate, I digress. Okay, so, well, I, I mean, I love the first one because it dealt more with the character and it's like, you know, at the end of the day, it's about a boy and his car. And the second one, I felt like there were just so many things just blowing up. And then I, w I was just like, wait, what's going on? Like, and by the end, you're like, there's a robot heaven. <laughs> you know, it's just weird stuff that was going on. And I felt like they lost track of the character. So what are some of the techniques that you use to try to keep people connected to your characters, especially since you're dealing with such, a lot of times, like superhero films or big action films and whatnot? Well, I'm, I saw TF2 and... <laughs> Uh, and I yeah, don't TF2 too two as yeah. well. Yes. yes, I haven't seen it yet, so please um, don't tell. Well, me. all I w all I would say about that movie is, 
well, I'm not even talking about the movie, but uh, uh, you just got to know what your characters want at every point in the film. And when you lose track of that, the audience doesn't want what the characters want anymore. Or the audience is just sort of watching things happen to your characters as objects rather than subjects. And there's no identification. It's just like you're just watching it should explode that's close to a character that you cared about in a previous movie. Um, and I just think being really fastidious about where are my characters emotionally at every point in the film, what do they want in this scene? And I don't mean like want in a general, huge, philosophical way, just no, literally. No, it can be from moment to moment, what yeah. do they want? What, what I, I want to get a drink. Yeah. I, I want to have sex with that girl. Like, it, it's like, because it's always interesting. It is an interesting exercise in every scene with the principal characters to figure out, because that's where conflict comes from, what do each of the characters want in the scene? Sometimes it's like, oh, what I want is just to not work a late shift or right. X, Y, and Z. But in the case of TF2, also, that's that's that and the film prior to that is also kind of a unique situation because you're reverse engineering a movie from toys. And Hasbro also has, you know, a set of legal guidelines like you can do X with the, these characters, but you can't do Y. So that makes it, you know, particularly harder. I mean, we, the, we even, and I'm sure on the X-Men too, and on the Batman films, we're reverse engineering from, you know, a set of guidelines. But at least in, in those situations, we were adapting characters and not, you know, and other, other literary forms that had pre-existed. It's hard when you're, I remember years ago being pitched, hey, you want to write Transformers? And look, God bless Michael Bay and for Duke. I couldn't, I just was like, I don't, I have no idea how to do that. Well, it's interesting because I, I really hope nobody will quote me on this because um, I don't want to get uh, attacked. But um, I think if you want a really good example of an action movie that screws up in terms of that's totally backwards, um, Pearl Harbor is a really good movie to watch, and here's why. When you're watching Pearl Harbor, right, there's these amazing sequences of shit blowing up left and right. But why? Like, wh why are we watching that? Is it because, I mean, some points in that movie you sit back and say, wait, this is like a snuff movie. I'm watching this, like, extended sequence of all these people I don't really know get killed. And I know full well they're not going to survive. There's not a lot of tension because, there's, you know, it's not like you think, oh, maybe they'll turn back the attack. No, it doesn't happen. And, and it goes on and on and on. And... It, it starts to make you realize it's almost like a postmodern action movie. It's like, let's take something that's inappropriate to make a bunch of cool, exciting action for, and then let's make an action movie about it. And, uh, you know, let's go to the POV of the bomb as it goes right. down. Why? Why are we in the POV of the bomb? What are we trying to make? Are we trying to make the I audience would, feel I, I would good argue about that it? was like, that was the character where they figured out what the character wanted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you know what? By the way, there might be a really great Michael Bay movie about that kind of embraces that, where it's about the explosions. It's about uh, his technique is amazing. I mean, he he's able to produce incredible. I thought Transformers, the first one, was his best movie. Um, I, you know, I, I really thought about half that movie was really quite good. Um, no, no. I mean, I, by the way, when I say I, I'm sorry. Half a movie being really good is amazing. Like I, most of the time, none of the movie is really good. It's hard to make a good movie, um, as except for Avengers. That's going to be a great movie. I, I need to say that for another reason. Sorry, uh, but anyway, I'm just saying like that's a good example of action gone crazy. Where it's we have a trailer, we know what we need to see, we're going to blow some shit up, but it's going to be the wrong subject to make an action movie about. Right, I mean, it, it, but it's all. It, I totally agree with all that. But it's also about not creating a character whose peril or life you care about. Like, Titanic's not that different than Pearl Harbor. You know how that's going to end up. You know that the vast majority of people are going to die. There were some survivors from Pearl Harbor. There were some survivors from Titanic. But you know the vast majority of people ain't going to live. If you create characters and a relationship that you are rooting for and you want to see survive, despite the fact that you know you're in a movie where at least half the people are. Then you actually invest. And Titanic, while not a perfect movie and not his best movie, is obviously a movie that resonated with a lot of people. And I actually love the movie. Right, but, but that's suspense. It's, it's creating suspense sequences where you're at the end, you know, sitting at the edge of your seat, hoping your characters can survive, not 
giant spectacle that you're supposed to think is See, cool. I would also argue, an inverted perspective. Sorry, one last. It's yeah. also an inverted pers point of view, which is like Titanic is not from the point of view of the iceberg. Right. <laughs> no, but it's also I. I would say because you were talking about disaster movies, I would I would consider Titanic a disaster yeah. movie, yeah. but uh, just a a particularly well executed one in that regard because it's. We're, we're going to have this massive epic thing that we know historically happened, but we're going to spend all this time investing in, in setting up the characters so that what you really care about when you see that movie really is just, you know, whether or not they'll those, the, you know, whether or not they'll hook up, whether or not, and, and, and all of the background is just spectacle, but it works, and you do feel bad when he, you know, floats off into the ocean or whatever, but, you know, because you've spent all that time investing. But also the spectacle is separating the characters from what they want. I mean, right. that's how this started is, is you know what Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet want. Right. And the ship turning over is fucking that up totally. Sorry, pardon my French. In Pearl Harbor, not really. I mean, it's not. It's like they want to live, yeah, but it's it's really more. Here's some characters, and then everything gets blown up, and here's the guys who are left when you're done, you know, and and then they tell the story. But anyway, uh, I I do think that's what Cameron is a master of suspense, and so even in his weakest movie, I think uh, you you have moments of suspense where the ship tilts, and you're hoping. I hope he scrambles down there and finds Rose. So. When you're writing your set pieces and all this action, how detailed are you in the description? Are you doing, you know, shot by shot stuff? Are you doing the emotional stuff? Does it matter on what's important in it? Is it cool stuff blows up here? <laughs> uh, there's, I, I, no, it's not cool stuff blows up here. But I would, I, I would say, you guys, I will all speak to this. But there's a difference between, I, at least I believe when you're writing an action sequence on spec and when you're writing it specifically for a director or on assignment. And so I would argue that when you're writing something on spec, the more detail and verisimilitude you can give that sequence, the better. Because it, it because when you're writing something on spec, you're you're writing a good movie, but you're also writing something that's a good read. Mm -hmm. And the more you know, I always like to say that the more specificity that you can put in, in, really into anything, I mean, drama, but, you know, if there's, if if you can take the time to do the research in an action sequence, it's not so much like the adjectives that you use. There's a, I, there's a, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, I, I know that a lot of beginning writers tend to use a lot of adjectives, and certainly I did myself, and I remember, um, there's a story that Hemingway gave some of his early writing to Gertrude Stein, and she, to you know, to mark up, and Gertrude Stein just crossed out all the adjectives and gave it back to him, and <laughs> said, there. But anyway, the point is, I, I think I think certainly specificity makes for a compelling read. So if you're writing a spec, be as specific as you can, and that and that will seem more real because it will place you. If you just say action scene here, well, there's then you're leaving it up, you know. People just can't really imagine what would possibly go there. If you're working for a specific director, that's a different kettle of fish, which maybe you guys can. I think it's. To I think you're totally right. It's entirely different. If you're writing a movie that you know is sort of uh, in production before you're even writing it, or as you're writing it, you understand the the infrastructure of all of the people who are going to contribute to creating the action sequence. Also, you've already gotten the job. You have already gotten the job, and and and. And the script is not as much of a sales tool as it is a blueprint, and they're two sort of different things. And you know the second unit director and the storyboard artist and all these other people are going to contribute to the action sequence, and you're actually more responsible for the drama and the dialogue and the structure than for the specificity of the action. Um, but I do think when you're creating something from scratch, also what's so important about the action sequences is you use the sequences and the wording of the sequences to create tone. Like I think uh, somebody whose scripts I love reading is Shane Black. Um, and even like a bad movie like Long Kiss Goodnight, I love reading that script because he takes the time to be poetic and to sort of create a voice in his prose that helps define the overall tone of the movie. However, by the way, I love having to love Shane Black's scripts too, other than Last Action Hero. Um, <laughs> but, and one of the things, cool explosion scene here, absolutely. He'll say what follow, you know, I remember when I first got to Hollywood reading, sitting in the MPA library reading all of Shane scripts, which were two or three at that point, and there's a sentence where it said, 
Okay, studio exec, hold on to your wallet because this one's going to bust it open. Uh, what follow? And it was something like that. And it's like what follows is the most ass kicking, blah blah blah, car chase you've ever seen since Bullet. But that's tone. And like that no, tells no. you the tone of the movie. It, it is no. tone, and I and I think that was a. I I read all those scripts too when they came up, but I think that that was a a particular kind of. He was writing for his. He knew his audience. Right. Well, and and, and that was sort of like a one-time. I've I've seen people attempt to do that since then, and you you kind of roll your eyes. Well, th it's true. You better be really careful. But what I would say is, there are times that people absolutely get away, and sometimes it's valid. Sometimes there are times when I'm writing it where I feel like saying, you know what happens here is. Everything gets thrown into a big action blender, and depending on who the director is, it either comes out good or bad. Um, <laughs> I, I don't do that because it's a good way to lose your job, but, but um, I, I do think that there are people, look, whatever makes your script entertaining and a good read, whatever, whatever works is what you should do. One thing you definitely shouldn't do that I, that I, I mean, look, this is a harsh reality of Hollywood. I've watched it happen in my own house. I've watched an executive read a script. Um, people tend to skip over the description, which is, it's really, it pierces my tend, heart. Tend to read the dialogue. They read the dialogue. And God help you if you have a, a descriptive chunk that's more, I remember hearing, I think Stephen D'Souza saying he never went more than uh, eight, line, eight, eight lines in it. And I'd, I usually have three or four. I'm three or four, yeah. too. I, I don't think I've ever had, I mean, certainly well, not in a while, more than four. And I, of course, being the stupid one. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, normally I don't, but I just wrote this Jason the Argonaut script that literally has pages and pages where there's no dialogue, which is, to me... But did you break up the chunks, though, so it's not enough, e easier to not read? Not enough. Mm -hmm. I did also not. fighting page count. No, I, no, I didn't break it up enough. And, and the thing is, I mean, I don't, I'd already had the job, so it didn't matter as much, but... but I tried to write something, I, you know, I remember sitting there saying to myself, why am I breaking this up? This seems so arbitrary, like, this is what's going to happen. I, I'm not you're, you're breaking it up because, as you well know from your wife, that these I know. poor executives go home on the weekend, you know, and they have to read 15, 20 scripts, and they don't do it on Saturday, and then Sunday comes around, and I know. maybe uh, they've got kids, and they've been, oh, I've got three hours. I'm you know. not saying it's smart. I'm just saying that's what I did, and, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's absolutely true, and that... That's what happens. I mean, it hit me when I was reading through the script again. You know, wow, they must not have read any of these pages because there's no dialogue on them. And, um, you know, it, it didn't, you know, eventually they did read it. But that is something that's worth keeping in mind that that's what's going to happen. They're going to take your script and they're going to glance through it. And if it doesn't keep them totally entertained, they're not going to read the description. So if but you write an action scene, don't write. 10 pages that describe every kick and every punch unless you have a way to write every kick and every punch that blows people's minds. Um, you but the, the other side of that I would say though is I think there's de there's also, yes, I absolutely agree with you, it needs to be entertaining, but I, I, the, the other writer that I read a lot of when I was starting was Walter Hill, who started out as a writer, and then you know, and Walter he gets clapped. But no, but but Walter Hill. If you go back and read the early Walter Hill scripts, really early when he was purely writing, they he writes with such an economy of word and and with such brevity, and 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 I think that's really impressive. Also to go through, and I do this a lot. Is when I'm done, I say, well, how can I say the same thing? in as few words as possible and still communicate mm -hmm. the same thing. Um, and I don't think that's just because executives have short attention spans. It's that's just, just better writing. It's yeah. just better writing, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you can cut it, you should cut it. I think is a good rule of thumb. It's what's going to happen when they make the movie anyway. But um, I'm just saying it's a tricky thing. You know, a lot of fans, they sit there and they want to write the action out. I know I do. You want to say, you know what, it's not going to be you know, this kind of kick, it's going to be a kick that I saw on YouTube that this guy did, you know, whatever. You just, you know, give him some storyboards with your script is better than writing it all. I also think that some, one of the dangers that people, uh, fall, one of the mistakes people make is they're too literal about the action too. So it's close on this and every beat of the action. And like, for me, my favorite action line I've ever written, uh, read rather, I wish I'd have written it, was in Butch and Sundance. Um, the, the scene where um, Butch fights Logan, who's one to take over his crew and he kicks him in the balls. The way that William Goldman describes it is he says um, he delivers the most exquisite kick in the balls in 
cinema history. And just the use of the word exquisite with right. kick of the balls is fucking is great. I mean, it tells you everything about the t again the tone. It's fun. Um, it it also somehow feels like weirdly ironic and brutal. And the, like he didn't describe. He takes three steps. He pulls back his leg. He swings through the air. It's just one sentence that tells you everything you need to know about that moment in the movie. You know what I, I am thinking of though, in the in the rewrite that William Goldman did of Last Action Hero. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm just thinking because it's so fill, it's so laced with irony that it needs to be said. Because William Goldman was h hired. I, I was a big fan of Shane Black, and he was hired to rewrite me to my chagrin. And then Shane Black is an even bigger fan. Of William Goldman, who was hired to rewrite him, which made him upset, but he wrote a line where it said, it's a scene where the kid is operating a crane, which, you know, was never in the original script, and it, it you know, in the original draft says, you know, Danny operates the crane, blah, 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 and in William Goldman's draft it said, um, Danny operates the crane. In this moment, he goes from being a boy to being a man. <laughs> And I remember me and my writing partner saying, that's why they pay him the big bucks. <laughs> uh, you know, I want to see the actor who's going to pull that one off. Um, so, but, you know. <laughs> Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Um, here, you can use Oh. Oh. Um, I wanted to. Oh, wow. Yeah, right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it, they can both do it. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to know how it informs your writing when you know who the actor's going to be in advance. Um, it, it can inform it a lot. I mean, I, 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 I personally prefer not to. I like to write my uh, characters, you know, as a blank slate. Also because I've been through so many experiences where you, you, you write it a certain way. You know, you write it for, you know, person X and you get person B, you know, you, you know, and, and, and half the time the person you get isn't even who you could have ever imagined. It's just they were hot. You know, suddenly it's a whatever, you know, a Will Ferrell movie instead of a Sylvester Stallone movie. or they, That kind of thing happens all the time where you end up changing the sex because, you know, so I tend to try to write, write, I try, I try to make the, 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 the character specificity through the action, and uh, I and I, I'm sorry through the um, through the dialogue and through their, you know, actions and nuances. It's I think it's harder when you're writing for a certain person. I I, I know most of the times I've written for a certain person, they've ended up not doing it anyway, and then you end up kind of having to change everything. I don't know, you guys. Yeah, no, I, I, same for me. I can't, if I'm writing something that's an original character or if it's uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, but a character you haven't seen b b with, a, with a different actor, um, I don't imagine an actor because it is constricting. The, the, the one time we all have to imagine the actor is when we're writing sequels. And in that case, actually, I don't imagine the actor. I imagine the character. So I'm sure you imagine Batman and not uh, Bruce Wayne and not uh, Christian Bale. I, uh, there's a being I like to write for the actor. I guess I'm different from these guys. I mean, first of all, Simon and I have both talked about this. I particularly like to write for Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart because you pretty much can write anything and they're going to make it sound better. But usually I mean, that's true with anyone who's English. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. No, but those guys are particularly... It is true that Eng it just sounds... Your question was much more eloquent than everybody else's. <laughs> um, but, I, like, I've, I've written a couple of parts now for Werner Herzog. I, he's, I have his voice in my head. I can write for him. I have a blast doing it. I mean, we, I, I've done some improv movies. Um, I, you know, I have kind of a different perspective on this. If it were up to me, like when I get the chance to make my big uh, science fiction epic, my plan is to let the actors improvise a lot more of the dialogue than you would ever see happening on an X Men movie because. That's kind of the dial. That's the dialogue I like. The dialogue that sounds in improvised, but um, I love it when you have a voice that you can write to. It just makes and and uh, to be fair, it might just be sheer laziness that it's just. It really is easier for me when I know what the voice is in my head. Um, but you definitely can run into huge trouble if you try to write to someone who's got a particular voice and it's clear that that's what you're doing to the reader. One of the things that people seem to hate, like if you, if you say, you know, he's a Robert De Niro type character, unless you are, you know, Tony Gilroy or someone, you know, or whoever the hottest person in Hollywood is, people will get very angry at you, so don't do that. But um, 
I think whatever gets you to the church on time, you know what I mean? Like, if it helps you to write for an actor, do it. Uh, okay, I got the microphone still. I'm going to charge forward. Hey, what's up, brother? Uh, what, do you guys think that there's a major difference in, like, writing supernatural thrillers versus, like, horror movies? Is there a difference in genre? Wait, wait, wait. Or? Hey, are you trying to articulate the difference between a supernatural thriller movie and a horror movie? Like, okay, psychological are you thriller, flashing supernatural forward? thriller, yeah. like, versus horror film. Like, is there you, you, Psychological... Well... To me, okay. What's the question? It's, he's saying, is it? You're saying, is there a difference between a psychological film and a horror film, or a supernatural thriller and a horror film? Either one. Is there a major differences between like when does a thriller cross into horror? Is there? Well, like, is Jacob's Ladder? Uh, I mean, I I would one difference. And it gets scary, right? <laughs> uh, what uh, you know? But a thriller is I I don't know. That's a, that's a good I. I to me, supernatural is different than thriller because supernatural means you can have things that wouldn't happen in nature. So, so there's there's definitely a difference there. I mean, I think I don't know what's the difference between a psychological thriller and a horror film. I think that is for the other panel. I mean, no, we're, no I mean, I think it's a valid question, but I think you've got to pay for that panel. Yeah, right? isn't there a horror panel that's coming? There is. There is and a there horror panel. There were still tickets available, right? Answered. <laughs> There are. There it, are you know, I think it's a very film. interesting question, what makes a horror film, is, is a fascinating question, and horror films are some of the most reliable, and, uh, you know, horror and science fiction are, I think, the two best genres in terms of reliably churning out actually good movies that do well, um, but I don't know what makes the difference. I, you know, there's a lot of people have written well on it, um, and I'm not one of them. I mean, I, I, look... The, for, for me, I guess is like there's a difference between I think suspense and horror, and I think suspense is the anticipation of horror, and and you can have great suspense movies, you know, from Hitchcock, you know, to all sorts of examples where where the fun of it comes from just just this mounting dread, and and I, and I can think of a lot of good I guess horror films that were more that I tend to like those more where it's about the mounting dread where you're just you're worried at every moment that something's going to come out of the shadows and the, you know, the camera's lingering. And I, I mean, I'm just taking a stab at this. I have no idea. That's but, a good definition. But, but, the, but the horror, I think, is when the suspense is over and it's happened and it's happening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the graphic de depiction of, uh, of violence that happens by surprise right. versus right. suspense. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Is Dawn of the Dead a horror movie? I say no. I say that's an action movie, um, particularly the remake. But even the original one, it's gory and it's got lots of brains and stuff. But it has the feel of an action movie in a lot of ways. But again, that's for another week. <laughs> right here. I had a question about uh, agents. Um, had one since January. Uh, great guy, liked my specs, sent it around town, got into Joel Pitcher's company, Joel Silver's company, and, and he, we actually, he pitched me a remake project. So we went through it, got excited, couldn't come up with the right idea, and now things have kind of calmed down. And I guess my question is, have you had a, how would you kick your agent in the ass to get him to kind of really pump you and get you out there and... Because I feel frustrated right now. Because it's like we had this momentum and now it's kind of... We, we feel your frustration, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's We have been there. Every, I think every writer of every caliber has, has been through that. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard because at the end of the day, it's, they've got a million other clients and they're just, they're, they're just by and large just flinging things against the wall to see what's, what sticks. And they are not... Here, I, I don't know if I speak for these guys. Did you think in your mind's eye, I'm going to come to Hollywood, or if you already live here, I'm going to get an agent, and that person's going to go out and do shit for me. And believe they're in they're me. Gonna get, and, and they're going to get me. me jobs. They're going to go get the jobs, and they're going to bring them to me. <laughs> it does not happen. No. It is not the way it works. It, now, occasionally, if you get to be really successful, some of that happens, but for the most part, you got to make your own career. Yeah, I, I would say 90% of all, even 
you know, from the beginning and, and on to today of, of the projects that I get involved in. And I do happen to like my feature agent, but 90% of them I generate myself. Or they're from, yeah, I mean, I guess what you're saying, they're from relationships that you've right, or already developed. Already the developed. Years, yeah. Your frustration, it, honestly, is something you're going to need to learn to deal with. Because I'm saying that feeling you have right now is it's going to exist for your entire career. Yeah. And and if you can learn to deal with it and live with it, and are also a really good writer, you will be successful. And if you can't, you will implode. I mean, but, but the other thing is, don't just not don't just wait for the phone to ring. Yeah. Okay. Uh, get out there, make your own connections, make your own. I mean, I mean, it's like dating. I mean, yeah. it, mm -hmm. you know. She ain't calling, it's over. You know, move on. But I and I think you and you have to keep dating, meaning like you have to keep writing. Like yeah. Don't wait for that project to come through. Like you, you wrote one spec that people like, write another one. You know, keep trying to generate your own work and hope that your agent gets you something, but assume that actually you're going to have to keep generating your own work. They will generate interest in you. I also have a really, really cynical attitude towards this whole thing, which is that even when things are going well, I sort of subscribe to the model that maybe every five or six years even if things are going well, you should leave your agent. Have you Be done that? Because, yes, because familiarity breeds contempt. It does. It and and, yeah. and, and there's always this honeymoon period when you go to get a new agent. Huh. And so, you know, if you if you leave every five years, you get another... You've changed agents another three, honeymoon times. every You know I, what? ABL, always be leaving. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. You know, there, there is a very compelling argument that I've heard. And I'm not, I've never been friends with my agents, which I... Uh -huh. I, I I think personally is a mistake. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't, I, I can't, you know, I was with an agent for 16 years, but, um, and then fired him. But I do think, I think it's Steven Soderbergh who doesn't have an agent, right? And just perpetually everybody is trying to sign him. And I think that's true. And, and in general, that's what you're going to get out of an agent is the aspiration. What the other agents who are trying to sign you might do some shit for you, but your agent just, your job is to impress him. As harsh as that sounds, that's just, it's a necessary evil. He'll, look, he'll be in your face it all, ultimately if he thinks come Christmas bonus time, he, he or she is going to get a big bonus based on something you sold or did. Mm -hmm. I mean, every once in a while there's, there are people that will see, see a talent and really nurture them. And, but I, I think that's a rarity. Yeah. yeah, I think that's even rarer with agents than with managers, too, just by the nature of their business and also more often than not belong into a larger infrastructure where they're also dealing with a corporate culture of their own that's in some weird way separate from their ability to agent your work. It's just their ability to exist politically and personally inside their system and yeah, be friends the, with at, their boss. At the end of the year, it's like, well, how much business did you book? Okay, well, your bonus is based on that. What well, we're giving, this person is going to be a partner instead. Because right. Just don't get angry at them. Seriously. Mm -hmm. try, try to separate yourself from it. That's just, you know, don't, don't get passive aggressive about it. Just say, okay, didn't work out. Got to get a new job. This guy, don't assume he's going to go fix the problems. He's not going to be able to. All right. Right here. Yeah. Oh, um, this is going to be a question about concept. Um, the action films that I love it, at heart are all character dramas. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, which, which is a story about a marriage, and, yeah. and yeah. how well you know your spouse. You know, Born, which is the universal question, who am I? Man on Fire, which is this love story and, and avenging the, the death of someone you love. But I'm curious about it, and if you could talk specifically about Mr. and Mrs. Smith, since those other writers aren't here. And also, is just how you developed that idea, because how you went from just sort of the simple, or I'm not sure where you started, but just, you know, what makes it action is that they're assassins. I mean, but underneath that is this very simple story. So the development of an idea that's big enough to contain, you know, an action film as opposed to being a small character drama. Where does uh, that yeah, I mean, I think the first of all, thank you for being kind about the movie. Um, I, I think if Woody Allen came up with the idea, it would have been a character, you know, dramedy. If somebody else came up with the idea, if uh, Robert Benton came up with the idea, it would have been a drama. I'm an action writer. I was at dinner with a friend um, who was in marriage therapy. She started talking about the process of marriage therapy with her husband, um, the way she was talking about it. She said that their therapist had given them a five-stage process um, that they had to accomplish, which was, I think, initiate, interact, 
communicate, compromise, and adapt. And I thought that was the best spine for a relationship uh, drama I'd ever heard before. And I saw that that's already interesting to me. Um, and then the more she talked about it, she was saying things like their therapist said they had to be laser focused on each other and, and had to block out the rest. And literally, she was like handing me the idea for a movie. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so I thought that was interesting. And I, I don't know how to write Kramer versus Kramer, ordinary people. So I went home and wrote a scene of two people in marriage there that night and wrote a scene of two people in marriage therapy. Um, who are assassins and aren't talking about that. So it came from a place of thinking, well, this is sort of an interesting dynamic in this girl's life. Um, I, I'm curious about relationships. I'm sort of fascinated by marriages that go wrong more than right just because it's more interesting and it's conflict. And I thought it'd be a cool idea to make a movie that was about secrets and lies um, in a marriage, but those secrets happen to be that they're killers. That's how it evolved. Um, I was handed the idea in some ways. I was handed the structure in some ways. Uh, when we were making the movie, um, and this is one thing that you find in terms of what Dave was saying, of inside of each scene knowing what the characters want, the actors will ask you that, or they'll ask the director. They need to know in each moment, in each beat of dialogue, what they want. Otherwise, it's, they don't even, in the same way that you have an intention behind all your actions. Um, and when we were making the movie every day on set, even if we were, she was jumping off a rooftop or, uh, you know, they were punching each other in the face, um, they would ask, what is this about in our marriage? What is this about in the, in the relationship? And sometimes I bullshit an answer and sometimes more often than not, I did have an answer because I structured it around the, their, their relationship. Um, and so they kept me honest in terms of it being a really character uh, centered story. But that's where it came from and I guess I would say the only lesson of that other than, um, I don't know, you should be friends with my friend who was in marriage therapy, uh, is the ideas for action movies can come from the most random places. Like I don't know what the, gen well I guess Die Hard is based on a book, but the genesis for that idea could have just been a guy's in a bad marriage, his job is getting in the way of the marriage, wouldn't it be ironic if his job ends up bringing them together and solving the marriage? And if you're an action writer, he becomes a cop or a spy or a superhero instead of you know, uh, I don't know, uh, Dustin Hoffman and Kramer vs. Kramer. <laughs> I thought I saw, uh, back there, right? No, uh, right, here? right in uh, the middle there. Great. Thank you. Hi. Um, I guess I'm wondering, in today's financial climate, um, from the level that, you know, we're all at in here, um, if we're about to start writing a new spec, are we smarter to write something big? You know, write something at the level, the size that you guys are making? Are they going to hire us with if we don't have a whole list of, of credits? Or are we smarter to do something the size of Moon or Memento, something that Lionsgate will make, something that's smart and filled with action? If you find out, you gotta yeah. call me and tell me. Um. <laughs> See, I would argue as a beginning writer at the end of the day, if if everybody wants a good script, and the script can speak for itself. So while yes, people like us will tend to get more jobs because we've got a track record or whatnot, every year there's still gonna be X amount of scripts that are gonna come across the transom from total newbies that are just really good. And how, you know, the spec market has cooled down a little bit right now because I think the studios are looking to double down and and base things on pre-existing properties. But that said, you know, it's all cyclical. And, it, you know, it's the, one, the nice thing about a script is that it can speak for itself. It's already written. It's not like you're, you know, a new director that has yet to make it. So, I, I mean, honestly, I would argue, I, th I think it's a mistake, maybe these guys would disagree with me, to try to write to the market. Yes. I think, I, I, to it. I, I think you should write what you want to write. And I mean, look at look what happened with Juno, you know, or the, I, ha the Hangover is going to make two hundred million dollars. I can give you a really, I mean, I feel like I can give you some really constructive advice. Um, in my in my in my eighteen or nineteen years in Hollywood, uh, I've helped a number of people get their start as screenwriters, and the people who had the quickest and easiest path were my friend who wrote a script uh, called Fish Out of Water, which was about, it was said 500 million years ago in the primordial ooze. It was about a fish named Darwin that wanted to be the first fish on land. It was basically the right stuff uh, about prehistoric fish. <laughs> Here's why. Animated script, it was 88 pages long, quicker read. Second of all, when that studio executive was reading the samples that weekend, they had to pick up my turgid serial killer thriller or whatever, and then they got to this crazy script about a fish 
you know, wanting to be out of land, that guy got a lot of meetings out of it. Um, my friend Mark is a very successful writer. Uh, Mike White was an early writing partner of mine. The scripts that he wrote that he tried to be commercial with, nobody cared about. The script Chuck and Buck, which if you've seen it, is a weird, weird movie, uh, really grabbed people. The truth is, it's a shorter path to write the thing that you feel like writing, no matter how personal or unusual it is. That is a better route in than trying to write to market. There are absolutely examples of people who have written to the market. There's people who've made a shitload of money that way. but. You know, unless we knew you personally and there was some reason why that was the right thing to do, in general, uh, writing being John Malkovich is the single best thing you could do for your career no matter what. Yeah, and I think the truth is that there are, are pl there are enough solid writers in Hollywood that know how to write a functional, conventional movie who are getting paid right now. That's not what Hollywood is in need of, and that's not the way you're going to break in. The way you're going to break in is to have something that's remarkable, that somebody's going to remark on that's unique, that's, a, that's an original voice. And even if that thing doesn't sell, like, I don't know right, what your guys' experience is. It's not about selling. Yeah, no, it's my, not my first script that got me started right. Uh, working was a script that never that got option for a hundred dollars um, and sits on a shelf uh, and will forever. But it was and it was a movie about grave robbers in 19th century New York running around with a dead body in a bag for the whole film. Uh, but it it was weird enough and specific enough and different enough that it got me every meeting that yielded me an agent, a manager, the first gigs I worked on with producers, the relationship with studio executives I still have. It's that f it's the it's a voice that's different from the five other specs they're reading that all want to be Transformers too. Specificity, right? But also passion. I mean, it's at the end of the day, he's absolutely right. I mean, they're they're. And you hear about them, they're in the ether. Sometimes these scripts will come out. Sometimes they'll get bought. Sometimes they won't get bought, but they but people like them because they were fresh and they had a unique voice and, and they, they wrote people in and they get Definitely. jobs. Definitely, I mean, uh, you know, like things like whether it was Hot Tub Time Machine, you know, which uh, my wife's friend just bought, or, you know, there's all these weird scripts that get bought, but um, I also think this is really important. I, I mean, I don't know what stage you are in your career. You are not writing a script at that, if you're at a beginning stage, you're not writing a movie. You're not writing a script to even be made into a movie. You're not even writing a script to sell. You are writing a script in the same way you would write a college essay or anything else. You are trying to get your foot in the door with a piece of your writing. If your writing gets you an agent, mission accomplished. If it turns into a movie, you just hit the lottery. And, and once you get an agent, your goal still is not to write a movie. Your goal is to write something that gets you more work. You do that, mission accomplished. Y you got, you know, a lot of people try to think, you know, they, they outsmart themselves. They're like, well, wait, what, it, what is Hollywood going to want to see? What are people buying, etc.? You're just trying to get your face in the room. By the way, just so you know, to make all of you feel better, I can tell you from having an inside track on this, at the same time that we all have an advantage because we have a track record, we Hollywood doesn't want to keep paying people like us. They really don't. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely I've been in those situations where like, oh, he's too expensive. Right, and also it. I don't think they believe, I genuinely think the people in this room after this discussion probably believe more that we could deliver a decent script up on this stand than a lot of the people we work for because it is their, the, the tendency is to think, do we really need to pay those guys that much? Couldn't we find someone who knows what they're doing who's cheaper? And and again, familiarity breeds contempt. Right. Mm -hmm. They hate us. No, um, <laughs> no, but it, but it is really true. People, there's been a big retraction. The the strike left people very angry. Um, you know, there's no question salaries were inflated. People are looking for people, uh, for younger writers who are cheaper, uh, beginning writers who they don't have to pay a fortune to. If you can step up and write something good, they're going to be psyched as hell to hire you. And and that's been, I think that's more true right now than it's ever been while, while I've been in Hollywood. That said, there's less jobs, so uh, it's also, uh, it's a bummer, but it's true. And writers that they can treat even more contemptuously. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, uh, I don't think that's their goal. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Would you uh, mind discussing your research techniques a little bit? Because what you guys are running are kind of outside the average guy's experience. Um, I believe in lo a lot just personally in research, and and I reached a point I don't know over a dozen years ago or so where I started employing 
I mean, I do research myself, but I started employing people to do research as well. And I'm thinking about this or that. That said, I mean, sometimes I still write from my own experience. I mean, Bruce Wayne went to Bhutan because I'd been to Tibet. And that's, that's how that happened, you know? And, and that, that temple that he went to is based on one that I went to. But um, obviously, I didn't ride around in a Batmobile or other things. But but I did, you know. Anymore. Yeah, anymore. <laughs> but I did, although I did ride in the Batmobile once, <laughs> the Tumblr. But, but, but what we also did was, um, I mean, they say write what you know. But obviously, in our instances, a lot of times, you can't know that. But you can meet people that know that. And so, you know, I did a lot of research in that instance with DARPA you know, sort of cutting edge technologies that they were coming up because I was interested in, you know, what are what are the technologies that the Defense Department is developing, you know, long range over the next 10 or 20 years. And so I would posit, oh, that's really interesting and probably more interesting than something I could have come up with on my own anyway. So I spent a lot of time talking to those guys, f for instance, and talking to people at MIT in the, you know, media lab and other things like that. I mean, I think I really believe in research and I try in the initial stage, again, I can't speak for these guys, but I try to do, I have a stage where I do research where I try not to come up with the story yet. I like, I want it to be as inchoate as possible and not sort of, and just, and I just, just kind of dump everything that's interesting into this big pot. If I'm writing something historical, I just I try not to get the story first. Do the research first, get kind of a basic understanding of it, then do the story. And then as the story starts to tell itself, then you can get more specific for the research. And, oh, I need to know more about this or that. I'm totally the same way. I agree with everything you say. I think the best, for me, research is just immersing yourself in the world. And it's the less targeted you are with your research initially, um, the more I think you'll get inspired um, because you're not going to be frustrated. You're not going to be ignoring things that are outside of the narrow target. Um, I, I do the same thing. I, I spend at least, I mean, it depends on the script, obviously. It depends on if I'm coming in for two weeks of a production polish, but it's, if I'm really going to write a script from scratch or take a script over and, and, and own it for a good amount of time, I'll spend at least a month or so just living in research, online, meeting people. I also have someone that does research for me, and um, it's incredibly important for the authenticity of the script, and I think authenticity is critical in these films. Um, otherwise, they feel kind of flimsy, and it, you know, it's... There's another kind of research as well. When you're adapting something like our comic books that we all adapt, or um, I, I worked on Sherlock Holmes last year, and so I, you want to immerse yourself in every piece of literature around um, Batman or X-Men or Sherlock, or you want to know that that text as well as possible. I, I totally agree with all. I mean, I just wrote this Jason the Argonaut script, so I spent, I think, two years researching um, Greek mythology and reading tons of shit about it, and also had people I hired... Um, just another thing to think about, um, just because I think these guys summed up everything on that subject that I would say, also watching movies and reading other stories that are similar, once you do have the story, pa definitely don't do that at the beginning when you don't quite know what you're going to do. I, I lo I'm totally with you that you want that period partly just for peace of mind of saying I'm not going to even allow myself to come up with the story because it gives you a break where you can actually read all day instead of having to you know stare at your computer screen all day um, but also consider what kind of story research can I do you know I'm, I'm writing uh, the Avengers movie right now I mean or will be soon and um, I'm thinking what movies can I watch that would be relevant to this because you know what? It's kind of fun to watch movies all day. And when you have a reason to do it, it's better than, you know, uh, taking out the trash or something. That's what else I'd be doing. So uh, I, I really try to find what are the story precedents for what I want to do and how much time can I waste doing that. And, and to, an odd thing to add to that, which we ended up doing, I don't know if you guys ended up doing this in the, with this on the X-Men, but we ended up doing it with Batman Begins specifically because... Going we, to Vegas? Is that... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we were trying to, you know, do something different, I, I guess, than what had come before. We ended up doing all this proactive research for the studio because, you know, when we turned in the script, we knew they were going to be like, whoa, you know, he does, he's not in the costume for 54 minutes and all this stuff. So we did, we did all this research on 
the big super Spider-Man, the previous Batman films, Superman. So we, we, we had somebody figure out in all those movies at what minute do they first get in the oh, costume. Yeah, yeah. Also, in all those movies, in total percentage time, we broke it down to how much are they in the costume versus. Right. And we did it so that, I mean, I know it sounds funny, but we did it so that when we went into the studio, we could say, well, actually, you know, in these four movies, uh, he's in the costume 43% of the time, and Bruce Wayne's in the costume 54 here. So. Right. I'll give you a statistic that you can use should you ever be in any meeting anywhere, which is however many minutes Anthony Hopkins is in Silence of the Lambs, he's like, I think he's in it like nine minutes total of screen time, something like that. You can look it up online. That's a really good kind of research to do because when you're in an argument about like how many pages, you know, well, it's the villain. Doesn't he have to be in? Well, actually, Anthony Hopkins was only in it's, this it's, movie and it made I, this much money. I know it sounds, yeah, it, but it's this proactive research. It's it's really interesting to know because because they do talk math and formula, you know, and it, and it, and it kind of freaks them out and 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 scares them. The other thing that you can this is do, why they hate us, by yes, the way. The other thing, and not him. The other He's thing you can enough. do every once in a while is, I remember James Cameron talked about, um, you know, his movies feel so real, and that that even the things that aren't real, he tries to give it the the phrase he coined was the veneer of authenticity, and if you can sort of make it sound real, and I've definitely had situations where I've had you know, uh, executives say, is this really real? And I say, totally. And it's <laughs> not, <laughs> you know, but because every once in a while you can't come up with some kind of precedent. And you say, totally. I got, I downloaded this paper from MIT and like, <laughs> and one time I even, the guy was like, show me. So I gave him this like 12 page paper, which I knew we would never read. But then it was like, wow, that's cool. You know, that's, I mean, I was told, I, I wrote a script called Suspect Zero, uh, which I've never seen the movie of, but w one of the things that I came across, I, you know, I went to Quantico and I did all this research about serial crime, and this was in 93, so it was before it was every TV show and movie was about it. And I came across this thing called episodic violent behavior disorder, which is a chromosomal disorder that's in a lot of serial killers that they've found. And it has linked attributes. And the linked attributes, I believe, were an elongation of the nipples and of the, of the toes. And so like a lot of uh, murderers and rapists, people like Richard Speck and whatever, had this quality. And for the script, I, I knew I couldn't do something with the nipples, but I did something with the elongated middle finger that basically there's a test that the character does where if a person's, if the fingers are a certain length, it's almost like the mark of a vampire. Now, what I found, I, at the time I just thought, that's so cool, I gotta use it, and I just made it the middle finger. Um, and I found out after that, uh, I guess it was Spielberg or one of the guys, one of the partners at DreamWorks had read the script and went around checking all of his kids' hands to see if the fingers were longer. And, and, but that's a good example of, there's no question that's what got me work. I mean, that's what made my career was that script and, and probably that little detail alone. So it's kind of like David said, it's total, I mean, I think in every subsequent meeting I said that's absolutely true. It's an elongation of the middle fingers. I don't even remember. I don't, I think I made that part up. but. <laughs> But it's based in truth, and I never would have come across it if I hadn't done all that ridiculous research. So I mostly just wanted to tell that story. You've been, you've been very patient back there. Thank you. This, where, where? Right here. My buddy, he's the one. Oh, OK. I just wanted to ask you all, um, what, do, what are your feelings about backstory and informing character? Uh, how important is it, and what's the best way to use it? I, th uh, well, okay, well, uh, uh, I think it's incredibly important. I think it's something that you need to know. I don't think it's something you need to be explicit about in the script. I think a mistake that a lot of um, uh, screenwriters make, and I think especially screenwriters who are a little less experienced, um, tend to over-explain backstory. They tend to have monologues about backstory. It should inform the behavior of the character. It shouldn't actually be a monologue in the middle of the movie about when their mother died. Um, but I, uh, for me, I do a lot of exercises before I start writing a script where I'll, I don't write little biographies, but I'll try to write um, little scenelets or scenes like the first time they had sex or the first time they fell in love or when their parent died or sort of seminal moments in their life.
life that will never literally be in the script, that maybe if I get far enough and lucky enough to survive through the production process, I'll show an actor, but it's just, it's, to me, it's the same as research. You're researching the people in the same way that we were talking about researching the world. You have to be as familiar, like you know a lot of personal stories about, I don't, I don't know this for sure, but probably your mom or your girlfriend or your wife, and you, ultimately you want to be as intimate as possible with your characters, and you can only know that through their history. That, that said, and I, most of you guys, at least if you're in the beating stages of your career, won't get away with this, but every once in a while, it's incredibly refreshing to have a character come on screen in a movie and not have a backstory. And you don't, you don't I mean, it's just character through action, which is, you see more often, in, I, I think, in films in the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, I love character through action, where you just... You, you pick up things about them, but but purely by by inference how they behave, and and not by articulating you know they were child molesters or something. No, that, like that. I'm totally agreeing with that. I'm saying that actually the only way that you can understand, I think the only way you can, for me, the only way I can know that behavior is through understanding their history and who they've been. That I will never want to be explicit about in the script. I actually think that anytime you're explicit about their history, the script should be in present tense. It shouldn't be in past tense. The script bogs down. And oh, yeah. I got to disagree with Simon. I don't like it when the characters give a big speech about their backstory. <laughs> um, I just no, but seriously, I think uh, the the curse of mistaking backstory for character is something that makes me want to shoot people. Uh, it's just. Uh, you know, someone telling you what happened to them has no impact on what you, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of the most frustrating things and people make entire careers, I mean I'm constantly sent scripts where the person has made their entire career on writing that kind of dialogue that's a story about themselves that reveals something, it's, you know, whatever. Actors sometimes like stuff like that, you know, they, they want to, I remember working on a movie with uh, an actor who wrote he said he wanted to add a little thing to the scene. I said, sure, and he gave me like two pages. And it was a, this is an action summer movie. It's like two page monologue about his parents. I was, I was like, okay. So uh, I'd say avoid, avoid, unlike Simon, you really should try not to put that stuff in your script. Well, but also, the, 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 and you will, studios will often try to shoehorn that crap in. Totally. And, and, it's, and it's horrible, and you're just going like, oh, my God, Well, because so it's horrible. an easy thing to think of. It, it feels like but it's that's fixing not, that's the problem. But that's not how, the, in real life, yeah. we don't go around often telling people our backstory. That's what I tried to tell him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, but he's just a bleeding heart who just... No, he that's just, what he likes He spews to his neuroses no, he to every to stranger. Tell, I don't know why he insists on the back. No, but in real life, I mean, obviously we have things... It would have been that, that thing that happened with you. Should I tell that right. story? <laughs> but the other thing is, not only in real life do people not often go around spewing their backstories, but, but often in real life, most people don't know why they're doing what they're doing. They're not, they're not, they haven't been to seven years of therapy. They haven't sort of figured out what their rosebud is. Most people are just operating, they have no, they're operating based on their unconscious. Right. You guys are just lazy. Yeah. <laughs>